Let me welcome you to the Independent Presbyterian Church, our morning worship service on this uh, very unusual, uh, unprecedented, abnormal um, Easter Sunday. Nevertheless, every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection, and whether we are at home or here in the building, uh, this, above all, is the Sunday in which we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so whatever inadequacies we experience, um, given uh, the various settings in which we will be worshiping, uh, let this be for you and for your family a, a time in which you celebrate and rejoice in the resurrection of Christ and his victory over sin and death and the devil. Now let me uh, review several announcements. One is that our offices will be open on, uh, uh, for the full hours that are normal but on a part-time basis in that there will be some who will be there and some who will not uh, be there uh, because we are, uh, we are varying uh, the schedule uh, so as to not uh, require uh, too much time uh, within the offices themselves for any of our people. But there will be somebody there, and you can always call in and contact uh, your, your ministers. Um, all regularly scheduled church events at the church are canceled. However, we are gathering more and more online, and so uh, this week the Garmer Bible Study will restart 7 o'clock Tuesday night, and Tim Foster will be teaching that uh, Tuesday at uh, 7 a.m., uh, the men's prayer meeting will take place. All men are invited to join with us for that. And then Tuesday at 10 o'clock, the women's Bible study, and all women are invited uh, to join us uh, for that. Um, also, if you'll check the bulletin and the messenger, there uh, are a whole, there's a whole schedule of uh, student or youth events, college student events, and uh, the New Covenant uh, uh, career group also. Um, then for, for those of you who are with us uh, by, uh, uh, by live stream, so as not to be a spectator, which is very easy to do when you're looking at a screen, just become a spectator, just watch what's going on. So as not to be one, let me encourage you to follow along as though the family couch were the family pew. Uh, that means pray when we pray, sing when we sing, bow your heads when we bow our heads, uh, say the creed, say the Lord's Prayer. I know there's an awkwardness about it, but I think that this is the best thing to do. Sit when we sit, stand when we stand. If you want, when we pray, kneel. Um, but join in as though you were here present with us uh, during the service. Uh, let me remind you as well that we have our evening service at the regular time at 5.30, uh, 5.30 this evening. Uh, let us remember uh, the reason why we are here. Uh, we gather on Sunday because it is the Lord's Day, because it is the Christian Sabbath, because we as believers are called to assemble for public worship. We worship God privately all through the week, but then on the Lord's Day, we come to the Lord's house, we gather around the Lord's table in order to offer to God public worship. We offer a morning sacrifice of praise and an evening sacrifice of praise. Uh, so that's what we endeavor to do today on this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we're here to worship God, to worship him as Jesus says, God must be worshiped. How is that? Spirit and truth. From the heart, that's the spirit, with the truth, according to the word, according to scripture, as commanded, as he requires, as Jesus says he must be worshiped and to worship him with reverence and with awe, uh, with a, uh, approaching our worship with the understanding that God is God and he is in heaven and we are on earth and he is our maker as well as our sustainer and redeemer. So let us so worship God. We'll join together by singing our opening hymn. It's number 277. If at home you have a hymnal, Christ the Lord is risen today, number 277 in the hymnal.
our great and almighty and ever-living God, our Father, you have truly wrought wonders on the earth. You created all things out of nothing. You formed man from the dust of the earth. You breathed life into his nostrils and set all things beneath his feet, giving him dominion over the works of your hands, all sheep and all oxen, all the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, all bow before him whom you have set a little lower than the angels. You care for us as a shepherd does his sheep, as a father his children. You have numbered the very hairs of our heads. You hem us in before and behind. You wrote our days into a book before there was one of them. Even in our sin and rebellion, you have not abandoned us, O God, but sent your Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be sin for us. He was cast out that we might be brought in. He died that we might live. He was raised that we all might be justified through faith in him. The angels, they look upon this deed and they wonder, how can we not but sing to you for such wonderful acts among the children of men? Receive now, we pray, our sacrifice of praise this morning. And according to the measure of your great love for us, so pour out your spirit upon us, even as we have gathered here and seek you in spirit and truth, both here and from our homes. Draw near to us, we pray. Walk among us, O God, for we are your people, and you are our God, even as we are in Christ Jesus, our exalted head, and come before you praying by the Holy Spirit as he first taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, you who have gathered here this morning in the hope of resurrection, let us all with one voice and with all of those in all places who share that same hope confess our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let us pray. Our Father, we have come into your presence 
where we find the fullness of joy with come to your right hand by faith, where there are pleasures forevermore. We confess, O Lord, that we are weak and foolish, that we are fragile, vulnerable, easily misled, prone to wander, distracted by the world and its pleasures, compromised by the flesh and its lusts, cowardly in the face of opposition. We grieve our faithlessness, our ingratitude, our unbelief. And, O oh Lord, we pray that you would forgive our sins. We pray that you would remember Christ's suffering, the insults and beatings, his scourging, his humiliation, his crown of thorns, the nails in his hands and his feet, the cry of dereliction, his thirst, his death. Remember, O oh Lord, that atonement was completed, satisfaction was made, redemption accomplished, Remember his words, it is finished. He offered one sacrifice for sin for all time and sat down at your right hand, O God. And so we look by faith only to the cross that we might be saved. Oh, that we might be pardoned in Jesus' name. Oh, that we might be forgiven and restored in Jesus' name, even as you have promised in your gospel. And, O oh Lord, we pray for victory over sin's controlling and enslaving power. We pray that its dominion might be broken. Even as we have been buried with Christ in baptism, let us be raised up with him to walk in newness of life. Let our old selves be crucified with Christ. That we might be no longer in bondage to sin. We pray that we might be dead to sin, but alive to you, O oh God, in Christ Jesus. Oh, that sin might not reign in our mortal bodies. And let us present ourselves to you, O oh God, as instruments of righteousness. And, O oh Lord, you have not only raised us up with Christ, but you have also seated us with him in the heavenly places. We pray that you would grant to your church the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of Christ. Let us know the greatness of your resurrection power. Power the gospel that we preach. Let your church faithfully proclaim your rich mercy and great love and faithfully declare the immeasurable riches of your grace and kindness in Christ Jesus. Oh, that we might faithfully proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ and your glorious grace that has been lavished upon us. Let us faithfully fulfill our commission, O oh Lord. Oh Lord, we pray for those who are sick. And we pray that they might be healed. And we pray for those who are at risk of becoming sick, the elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, those who are uh, working in the, in the hospitals, uh, those who are uh, delivering uh, our groceries and uh, involved in the whole supply chain uh, to the stores and to the, to the pharmacies. We pray, O oh Lord, for all those who are at risk. We pray for all those who are afraid of becoming infected, that you might calm their fears. And we pray, O oh Lord, for those with other medical conditions, that they might not be neglected during this time of focus upon uh, this coronavirus. And, O oh Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our national leaders. Uh, we pray that, that they might know when to begin to lift the restrictions that are upon the nation and limit the impact of both the infection and the, the, the impact of the restrictions. We pray, O oh Lord, for the unemployed, that they might be able to feed and shelter their families we pray that they might be soon back to work. We pray that our students might soon be back to school. We pray for those who are elderly and isolated and lonely, that they might soon be restored to their companions and loved ones and family members. And, O oh Lord, we pray for Christian mission around the world. We pray that with the daily talk of infection and death, uh, we pray that you would lift the minds of the masses of humanity to things above from the things that are below. We pray 
that they might be lifted from time to eternity. We pray that they, there would be universal contemplation of the meaning of life and of death and of the realities of heaven and hell, and that the multitudes might be driven to the foot of the cross and into the arms of a risen Savior. So we pray, O oh Lord, for, for international revival. We pray that to, from this evil, that the result might be great good. Your glory, O oh God, and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And O oh Lord, as we give attention to your word, open its meaning to our understanding. And even as the Apostle Paul prays, so we too pray for knowledge and wisdom and understanding and discernment and insight through the Holy Scriptures that we might have hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now open our Bibles to Romans chapter 7 and then in turn uh, to Matthew 27. Our reading from Romans is our 10th reading from this book. Uh, we read the Bible believing that it is the inspired and inerrant word of the true and the living God and our only rule of faith and practice. In, in chapter 7, uh, the Christian's freedom from the law's condemnation is discussed in verses 1 through 13. And all that he has said in chapters 6 and 7 through verse 13 is not to mislead us so as to think that we will no longer be engaged in a fight of faith, which fight he describes in verses 14 through 25. Beginning at verse 1, Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Likewise, my brethren, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. 
Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in me. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. <coughs> Excuse me. Through, our, through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And then from Matthew, chapter 27, beginning at verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. When Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said, While he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. We're going to sing now Psalm 16. Uh, the 16th Psalm is a Psalm of David. It has a very deep devotional quality. He recognizes that God is his portion. That's the language of the apportionment of the land of Israel. And he says uh, that God, not the land, is his portion, and that the lines that 
mark out the land. They have fallen to him in pleasant places, apart from any consideration of the land. The lines are in pleasant places. Why? Because of his knowledge of, his relationship to the true and the living God. And at the end of the psalm, uh, we read of a messianic prophecy, a prophecy of the Christ that the Holy One will not be left in the tomb to corrupt, but rather will be raised from the dead. So singularly an appropriate psalm to be sung on Easter Sunday. Psalm 16, we'll sing it in its entirety.
Father, the lines truly have fallen for us in excellent places. Our inheritance is a beautiful thing for us to behold and know as our own. And so we give you thanks for the stone removed from the tomb. We thank you that our Savior is raised. We are glad for a sure and firm hope of the resurrection that is ours, even in Christ, who is seated now in the heavens with you. We rejoice for the gift of the Spirit and the church that you have given us to sustain us in this world until our hope of resurrection is made our sure possession, our faith made sight. And finally, we praise you, our Father, in the knowledge that with each passing moment, the day is closer now than it was when it first appeared to us. And as we wait and watch, Father, behold, here we are. The people that you have chosen for your own possession, receive us, take us, use us for your own glory as you have dis chosen to display your grace in us before a watching world. Use us, our lives, sinners, saved by your grace. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
For those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, the practices of our congregation, uh, the last uh, four weeks have been unusual in yet another way in that normally I'm preaching through John's Gospel. And every Sunday I thought, you know, I'm just going to go back to the regular routine. And every Sunday, as if we got closer and closer to Sunday, I thought, I, I just can't do it. And so, each week, I have determined to address the current crisis, at least attempt to, from a Christian and biblical perspective. Uh, so this is the fourth, in addition to it being a, an Easter Sunday, and I do hope that next week I'll be able uh, to return to the regular routine. No promises, though, but I think that's what we'll do. So let me, let me start by just talking of the, about Easter itself, and in terms of my own personal uh, pilgrimage, there, there are several, a couple of landmarks in my own spiritual development in connection with Easter. The first one that I can recall, it goes back to somewhere in the middle of my college years. I came home from college for Easter vacation, and Easter Sunday went uh, to the First Baptist Church of Dominguez, where I grew up, and we began to sing the opening hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. And it was a strange phenomena came over me. I, I was very emotionally moved. And in addition, and really the key was, I was understanding the words for the first time. Uh, I think probably every Sunday of my entire life we'd open the worship service with Christ the, Wesley's great hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. A and this time, though, I was understanding the words. I was entering into the meaning of the words. I was moved by the words as well as the music, which was said something about the fact that I was moving somewhere spiritually. I was growing. I was developing. And the words were making an impact. Even though I'd heard them and seen them all my life, they were now personally meaningful to me. Uh, another landmark, about 10, 11 years later, uh, took place right here in this building, my first Easter Sunday here in Savannah. That would be Easter of 1987. Uh, we had been averaging about 230 people on Sunday mornings in January, and then in February and into March, it, it jumped up to about 330 by about 100 in the course of a month to six weeks. And uh, this building feels fairly empty from the high pulpit when you have just two to 300 people in attendance. Well, Easter Sunday, there were f over 500 were here. That, that was the first time that that had happened. And we, what did we sing as the opening hymn? We sang, Christ the Lord is, is risen today. And um, the impact on me was powerful. Um, this building filled with voices singing to the praise of Christ, that was a very powerful experience for me. And it was one of those moments that one senses that thing, all, everything is right in the world at that moment. Um, God is getting the glory he deserves. Christ is being exalted as he should be. Uh, we're doing that which we were made to do. All is right in the world. Uh, this Sunday, we are somewhat disappointed, all of us, because our full Easter experience in our congregation is not being entered into. We've not had our Monday, Thursday communion service. We've not had our Saturday morning um, pancake breakfast and uh, egg hunt. Uh, th this morning, the church is not decorated with lilies and filling their, their space with their aroma. 
The church is not full, the choir is not singing, and we're not going to end the service with that great crescendo of praise when we fill the balcony with choir and others who join the choir and, and the hallelujah chorus is sung. So, there is a measure of disappointment that um, concluding crescendo is another one of those moments where on an annual basis uh, one senses that all is right in the world. Things are as they should be. Uh, and when that's being sung live in particular, it, uh, even though it's been sung every year for years and years, I've been here a long, long time, and it's been sung for years. It's emotionally moving. And it, and it just, it represents things as they should be. Uh, Christ is, is getting the glory that he deserves. And here, here in the church, 90% of our congregation, 90 plus percent is at home. Uh, we have canceled virtually everything or moved it online. Our Sunday school, we're not having our communion. We're, our social contacts as a community, if we consider it from that perspective, 95% reduced. Uh, there's no weekday activities at the church. And so we're disappointed and we ask ourselves, can anything good come out of this? Or can anything good uh, proportionate to the bad? And the answer that I want to give this morning, that I've hinted at at the devotionals this week, is that yes, simplifying the life of the church allows us to focus on that which is really important. Death is in the news. That's a bad thing to be talking about, thinking about death all the time. Except that contemplating death is a good thing. If it, if it leads to thinking about the meaning of life, uh, the brevity of life, the uncertainty of life, and the certainty of standing before God and entering into eternity and, and whether or not I'm ready to do so. And so simplifying the life of the church and simplifying this service of the church is a good thing because we are geniuses of distraction. We fill our lives with amusements, with entertainments, with various pleasures, and so the great questions of the day, they go unanswered. In fact, they, they go unasked. Never mind unanswered. Christmas is an example of this. Christmas has all, been, all but been hijacked by an omniscient Santa Claus uh, with his red suit and his long beard, and he has this amazing sled that flies through the air, uh, pulled by flying reindeer. Um, who, he's able, a big fat guy, he's able to slip down a chimney uh, and, and has gifts for the children all over the world and knows whether or not they've been naughty or nice. I mean, uh, it's, it's really, really re re remarkable the degree of distraction that we have at Christmas time. 1949 brought on Rudolph, 1950, Frosty joined the gang. The thing has been utterly commercialized. It's all about sales and, and buying things, and it's all been materialized rather than spiritualized. It's, we're geniuses of distraction. Oh, so at every Christmas season, we should be asking ourselves, what exactly are we celebrating? Well, what we're supposed to be celebrating is the, the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God is with us. Uh, then at Easter time, we've got the bunny, the Easter bunny and the eggs and the baskets and all of that goes back to spring fertility cults and symbols of fertility, fertility and, and we, have, uh, we have incorporated those into our Easter celebrations and, and you know, most of this is, uh, is, is harmless enough. I mean, we, uh, we ate our breakfast and our dinner last night on paper plates with the Easter bunny on them. Uh, th this, is, this is what we do. Um, the Easter bunny and eggs. Uh, that, that was always confusing to me. Do Easter bunnies lay eggs? Or what's the connection between the eggs and the bunny? 
is always a curiosity uh, for me. Uh, so, but what I'm saying is that we are genius as a distraction. We are genius as a trivializing that which is vital and, and important. And, and, and so it, uh, it really pays to ask the question, what exactly are we celebrating at Easter time? And, and the answer is we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. We might remind ourselves that our Presbyterian and Reformed churches have a long history of resisting distractions. We call our form of architecture a plain style of architecture. I don't know if you knew that. That's how it's characterized. Think of the New England meeting house with the white clapboard sides and the very simple architecture. It's beautiful architecture, but it's very simple. The same is true of, of our meeting house here. It's simple. Uh, there aren't any decorations. There aren't any pictures. There aren't any statues. There aren't any symbols. Uh, it's, a, it's a very plain style. It's beautiful. The materials are, be, are, are, are first of uh, the first order. It's marble. It's, it's mahogany. It's, it's very skilled craftsmanship is evident everywhere, but it's, a, it's in a plain style. Protestant plain style. We talk about um, our preaching is historically known as plain style preaching without much in the way of embellishments, not like the courtly preachers of the royal household with all of uh, their elaboration and their flowery language and sophisticated terminology and their literary skill is all very showy and attention drawing. Uh, there, there was a resistance to that in, in our tradition. We want to preach in a plain style. We want to use common language. We want our messages to be accessible to ordinary people. We, we want to present the gospel in, in a way that's unembellished. Again, even, even, we even speak of a plain style of dressing. Dressing so as not to draw attention to ourselves. It, it doesn't need to be out of style dressing, but it's in a plain style. We're not trying to draw attention to ourselves. We're not trying to distract people from other things that are important. So we present ourselves in, in, in a plain style. That's part of our heritage. Others see the embellishments as enhancements. And so their services are cluttered with processionals and incense and symbols and pictures and statues and ceremonies and rituals and postures and gestures and altars and vestments. They see these things as enhancements. We see them as diverting attention from the primary means. What our, our aim is in the, the language of 1 Corinthians 7.35 is undivided devotion. Or in the words of the King James Version, we're to attend upon the Lord without distraction. That's really what we have always aimed in our tradition as Reformed Protestants. And so the, if there's a good thing that's to come out of uh, the celebrations of this year, uh, it is that, that we're going to be able to focus on that which is really central, on that which is vital, on, on uh, the meaning of Easter itself without our celebration being cluttered by what goes on outside of the church or by what's going on inside of the church. Undivided, undistracted devotion. We're able to zero in, we're able to focus, we're able to give our undivided attention to that which actually calls us together Sunday by Sunday, week after week, year after year. So then what is that focus? Number one, I got four points. Number one, Jesus' identity. Our intention at Easter time is to answer the question, who is Jesus? Well, who is Jesus? Well, he's Emmanuel, he's God with us. He's the son of David. He's the Messiah of Israel. Who is Jesus? He's the God-man, the one who is truly God and truly man, who said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one, who said in John 14, 9, to see me is to see the Father. He's the one the Apostle Paul describes, Colossians 1.15, as the image of the invisible God. In Colossians 1.19, he says of him, all the fullness of the deity dwells in him. In Hebrews 1, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of God's nature. So what do we focus on? We focus on his identity. He's 
the Savior of the world. That's who he is. And so at Easter time, that's, that's what we want to be exalting. That's what we want to be celebrating. That's what we want to be emphasizing. That's what we want to focus on is answering the question, who is Jesus anyway? And number two, we want to focus on the meaning of Jesus' death. It's a well-known event that Jesus of Nazareth was executed by the Roman government on a cross. The Romans and cahoots with the religious authorities of that day. Oh, what's the meaning of that death? Does it have any meaning at all? Or is it like the death of Socrates? It, it's just a death. It doesn't have any particular meaning at all. Or the death of the Roman Gracchi brothers, the reformers, in, in the late uh, years of the Republic. They died. It was a tragic thing. Socrates' death is a tragic thing. But is there any inherent meaning in the event? Uh, well, no, not, not at all. Well, what about with Jesus' death? Is it just a tragedy? No, no, it's not a, a mere tragedy. No, it's filled with meaning and purpose and design and intention and accomplishment. Uh, what then is the meaning of his death? Well, he dies in the language of John the Baptist. He dies as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's John 1.29. Jesus dies, in other words, as, a, as the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system was but a whole system of typology that was meant to anticipate the, the one who would shed his own blood, offering himself as an atonement for the sin of the world. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to put away sin. Those sacrifices were always inadequate. They were only temporary and partial it's impossible for, by, the, by the death of a, of a goat or a, or a lamb to adequately deal with the problem of sin. And yet without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin, the writer to the Hebrews says. Again, all of those uh, sacrifices, they were anticipatory. Uh, they were a kind of a visual aid, demonstrating to the people of God the necessity of blood sacrifice. Why? Because the wage of sin is death. Uh, Romans 6.23 the soul that sins shall die, says the Old Testament prophets. This is what God requires of sinners. This goes all the way back to the garden. God declared to Adam and Eve that the day that you eat of it, you will die. The, 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 the result of sin is death. There's a payment that's due. There's a debt that is owed. There's a wage that must be paid because of sin. And the holy God requires of it. And what Jesus does is he pays the payment. He, he, he pays the wage. He pays the debt. He sheds his blood, which is of infinite value and therefore adequate for the sin of the whole world. The infinite debt is, is paid by a debt that is of infinite value and, and worth. So it's not a, a mere tragedy. No, there's that which is accomplished. It's an effectual death. It's a sin-bearing death. It's an atoning death. It's a death through which salvation is offered to the world. And so what do we, what do we celebrate at Easter time? We, we celebrate, we focus on the identity of Jesus. We focus on the meaning of his death. Thirdly, we, we focus on the fact of his resurrection, that this is an event that took place in space and in time, in real history. Uh, what do we mean by that? We mean that, that if you had been there, if you had been there in Jerusalem on Easter Sunday morning, you would have seen an empty tomb. If you had been there and were numbered among the disciples, you would have seen a physically resurrected Lord Jesus Christ you would have seen one who was cold and dead. You would have seen him raised from the dead and alive, having been raised triumphant over the powers of evil, over the power of death. In other words, this is a real event. This is not a myth. This is not a fairy tale. This is not just a hopeful story. This is not a spiritual resurrection. Uh, it's not as though the, the disciples learned to 
uh, raise their own faith by reinterpreting his death as a, as a spiritual death and his resurrection as a spiritual resurrection and the body was still in the tomb. No, no, this was a physical resurrection. It took place in space and in time and in history. He was raised from the dead. Well, what's the meaning of it then? What's the meaning of his resurrection? Twofold. Number one, it's verification. Verification of Jesus' identity and his mission and his claims. Romans 1.4 says that he was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection from the dead. Declared to be, verified to be, confirmed to be. The Son of God through the resurrection from the dead. Consequently, you can rely on him, you can depend upon him. The uh, French diplomat and politician Talleyrand from the late 18th and early 19th centuries was once approached by a man who said he wanted to found a new religion. He said he was found the current religions to be inadequate, of course, concluding um, Christianity. So this is the, you know, this is the period around the period of the French Revolution, and so there's all kinds of exotic thoughts uh, arising out of France of that day. Uh, so here comes a man, he wants to start a new religion. All the, the current religions, they're inadequate. They're, they're not up to the task. Uh, so he goes to Talleyrand and he says, how would you suggest, how do you recommend I go about starting a new religion? Talleyrand thought for a moment and he said, I propose that you should have yourself executed and then rise from the dead. In other words, there's something that's being proven if you can raise yourself from the dead. You, you'd be worthy of a following, wouldn't you? You'd be worthy of having some disciples, wouldn't you? If you were able to rise from the dead, if you were able to conquer death, if you were able to overcome the bonds of death, break those bonds and, and bring yourself back to life, oh, you'd, be, you'd be worthy of being worshiped. You'd be worthy of, of being honored. You'd be, you'd, you'd be worship of, of, worthy of a, of, a, of a great following, wouldn't you? You could found a religion. Well, Romans 1, 4, declared to be the Son of God, proven to be the Son of God, verified to be uh, the Son of God, and therefore his identity verified. Therefore his mission validated. Therefore his claims proven by his ability to conquer death and the powers of death. The power of sin, the power of Satan, the principalities and powers that are in the heavenly places. So it's a, it's a verification and it signals victory, conquest. 1 Corinthians 15, 26 identifies death as the last enemy. He conquered death. He conquered the devil. He rendered powerless, uh, Hebrews 2.14, him who has the power of death, that is the devil, rendered him powerless. Uh, the power of sin is broken. We just read that in Romans 7 this week, Romans 7, uh, 6 last week. You say, well, I still see death right now. We're, we're experiencing lots of death and a lot of talk about death. Death is still out there. Well, I think it's the difference between D-Day and V-E Day. D-Day, the landing takes place and it's successful. World War II is going to be won. Now there's a number of battles that are going to have to be fought. There are skirmishes and, and battles uh, all throughout France and in the Low Country and then in, in, on into Germany. But V-E Day, Victory in Europe Day, is assured by D-Day. That's, that's, I think, a rough analogy for what we celebrate when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. It's, it's D-Day. The victory has been won. Now there's still skirmishes ahead. The devil still is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But it, these are the, the roars of a dying fiend who is on his way out, who has been defeated. The resurrection means the defeat of injustice. It means the defeat of oppression. It, it means uh, the defeat of the powers of, of darkness. Jesus triumphs over the principalities and the powers. It means they are, they are a defeated enemy. They can still cause trouble. There's still these battles. There's still these skirmishes that must go on. But victory is assured. Christ is the conqueror. 
And as believers, we enter into that conquest. The end of Romans 8, the Apostle Paul says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. At the end of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, thanks be to God who gives us what? The victory. We've entered into the victory that was accomplished at the cross through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look around at the world and we see pain, we see suffering, we see so much sorrow, we see so much heartache, we see so much in the way of evil, so much in the way of injustice, so much in the way of oppression. Yet we are able to look at those things and look at them with hope because we know that those powers and those evils and those hardships have all been conquered through the cross. And we know that they've been conquered because Jesus was raised victorious over them all. Conquering him, let me repeat it again, Hebrews 2.14, the one who had the power of death. The one who is a liar and the father of lies. The one who the Bible says was a murderer from the beginning, and we might add, the father of murderers. Conquered, defeated. And we enter into that victory. And then, fourth and finally, we focus in on the certainty of his promises. So, number one, Jesus' identity. Number two, the meaning of Jesus' death. Number three, the fact of his resurrection. And fourth, the certainty of his promises. These are very, very uncertain times. Now, for many of our generation, there's never been a time of uncertainty quite like the uncertainties that we are experiencing right now. Reality is life is always uncertain. We can't guarantee anything about life. We don't know what's going to happen the next moment, the next minute, the next day, the next week, month, year. We, we don't know what's going to happen. Life is always uncertain, but there is a, a, a fresh emphasis upon that reality. We're experiencing that reality more now than we have in, in the past. You know, even the scientists and, and, and the doctors, they, they don't know what's happening out there right now. They don't know the rates of infection. They don't know the relationship between the rates of infection and the rates of death. These things are still unknown. We don't know to the extent to which this is uh, more deadly than any of the flu-like predecessors, predecessors or epidemics before. We just don't know those things right now. There's a lot of uncertainty. And it's going to be a while before we can become more certain about, about any of this. There's so many out there who are asystematic that we can't we can't get to the hard data at this point about how deadly this thing actually is. So that's all unsettling. The economy is unsettled. What we, we, we learned this week, 17 million people have filed for unemployment benefits. That's a number larger than the number of unemployed during the Great Depression. All right, the country's three times the size that it was then. Nevertheless, that's a remarkable statistic. And there, there's nothing apparently going to slow the number of, as we've gone from uh, the unemployed in the hundreds of thousands to 3.3 one week, 6.6 .6 the next week, 6.6 .6 the, the week after that. 17 million. That, that introduces a, 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 a profound measure of uncertainty in the lives of family after family after family. Life is uncertain. Here's what's certain. Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. John 14, 19. Jesus promises, because I live. Does he live? Yes, he lives. He was raised from the dead. Because I live, you also, you who? You who are my believers, you who are my disciples, you who are following me, you also will live. You can count on that. That's certain. We can, we can, we can build our lives on his promises. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who believes in me, he who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. We can count on that promise that he will satisfy the hunger of our souls, that he will quench the thirst of our souls. He is the bread of life, of eternal life. 
of spiritual life, of real life, of true life. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follow me, follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. There's a great deal of darkness out there, is there not? Darkness, the unknown, the dark representing ignorance, the dark representing evil. That's the world. That's the world that we live in. A world in which there aren't any answers. And Jesus identifies himself as the light of life. And he promises that if we will follow him, we will have, we will not walk in that darkness, but we will have the light of life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he die. And the one who lives in me, and lives and believes in me, shall never die. He utterly transforms death so that when we die, our death will be as, love, as though it were no death. How do we know that? Sure. How do we know that that's certain, that that's going to be the reality? Because he says, and then proved himself to be the resurrection and the life by rising from the dead. Transforming death so that death, and the Apostle Paul's language, has lost its sting. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Well, it, does, it no longer has the victory. Its sting has been removed. It's a different kind of event for the disciples of Jesus so that Jesus can describe it as no death at all. The one who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Turn it into a promise. Follow me and you will be on the way, the right way, the true way. You will know the truth. You will have real life. You'll no longer be dead in your trespasses and sins, but you will come to life. The ascended Christ says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What would you describe as your beginning and the end? That which you're living for, that for which you would die, that which is everything to you. You're, you're first and last, you're Alpha and Omega, you're beginning and the end. Jesus says, that's what I am. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. The fact of the matter is, nothing is certain in this world. And the fact of the matter is, we cannot eliminate the dangers. We cannot live a risk-free life. The grim reaper stalks us all every day that we live. We never escape the shadow of that grim reaper. But what I can say is with Job that I know that my Redeemer lives. And in my flesh I shall see God. And I can know that he has been raised from the dead and that he has gone to prepare a place for me. And that he will come again and receive me and all his disciples. All who believe to himself that where he is, there we may be also. You know, nothing is certain in this world, but the promises of Jesus, they are certain. And because he lives, we also who believe will live. Because he imparts life to those who are spiritually dead in their trespasses and sin. He brings truth to those who are blind to the truth. He shows the way that is in himself, the way to heaven, the way to salvation. And we can know this. We can be certain about it. We can be confident in this. In a life, that, in a world that is full of constant, unending certainty, we plant our feet on the rock. When all around us is sinking sand, we plant our feet on an immovable rock. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And we stand securely there as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we, we rejoice, O oh Lord, in 
the hope of the resurrection, the certainty and confidence of the resurrection in our Lord Jesus Christ, having raised us from our spiritual death, having imparted his life to us, having given us his Holy Spirit, having reconciled us to our maker, having given us the gift of eternal life. Oh Lord, we give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together now in singing hymn number 273, Jesus Christ is risen today, 273 in your hymnals. Before I uh, pronounce the benediction, um, let me remind you to exit the building with safe social distancing. That means at least six feet, even as we have been sitting in pews that are six feet and nine inches apart in compliance with the requirements of the civil authorities. Let me uh, pray the, print, the benediction 
and then be dismissed to a time of undistracted devotion at home. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.